All right, so my name is Derek Fry. I'm a senior market strategist at Forex Traders Daily. with the Forex Profit Predictor. And as usual, I will do a live look at the markets uh, for the week ahead through the eyes of Harmonic, the market harmonics, which is what I do, for those who don't know. <coughs> um, my sessions are totally open, total free-for-all, so don't be shy. The only dumb question is the one you failed to ask. Um, so that's really what my intention is always with these webinars, just to have a frank and free, open discussion with y'all and uh, and see where it takes us. So with that in mind, what do you guys got today? Anything exciting? What's new out there in Forex land? What's the latest in the rumor mill? Andre says, great call last week on U.S. dollar weekly. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, not my call. I would never t try to take credit for it. Um, I was simply following along with what the system told me was likely to happen, most probable, and as usual, it did. Um, so, thank you for the kind words, but I would never try to take credit for it myself, per se, like saying that I knew blah, 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 blah. I knew nothing. I knew, the only thing I knew was that I I am right to follow along with the system. That's the only thing I knew. I have no clue if it was going to work or anything like that. Hindsight, of course, being 2020, this in this case it did work. But if it didn't, it wouldn't have changed anything. It wouldn't have changed my opinion, not my opinion, my outlook or my actions. Most importantly, it would have influenced them exactly 0%. Because I'm not actually making emotional decisions here. I'm just following along. Cable four hour butterfly four hour. That's what we're on right now. Let's blow this thing up. I talked about this in my webinar this morning with my um well with both of my groups. Um and uh you can see the bearish butterfly that you're talking about on the four hour. I'm going to go down to the one hour. So you can see it a little better here. Um, it's a little messy because I got a lot of stuff on here, but you can see the bearish pattern, the B points back down here at 157.50, and the cyclical projection is lower. Hurst exponent is very anti persistent. So overall, do I like it? Yeah. Um, am I in it at this moment in time? No. Um, I want to be selling strength above 159, and then I'm going to run stops above 59.75. Um, so I'm trying to be patient, like I said, and, and wait for some more strength, and I may miss it. It may not come, and that's okay. But to answer your question, yes, it looks okay. The risk-reward's just not very robust at this time. It's about one-to-one. -one just a little better than one-to-one, -one, and I want it to be closer to two-to-one before I would really be interested in it. And yeah, Andre, like you said, just following the system. I remember the last trade that I placed that had that was based on my opinion. It was 19... I think it was 1998... And that was after almost over 15 years of trying to trade my opinion. <laughs> Largely unsuccessfully. Had some success with it, but on balance, not nearly as much as I did when I stopped trading my opinion. I've made a hundred times more money in the last five years than I did in the first 15 by not trading my opinion, by not having an opinion. Not even not trading it. I don't, I've taken it a step further. It's not that I'm not trading my opinion. It's that I don't even have, to have an opinion, I would have to be following along with like news and events and all that garbage, and I don't. I'm no interest in that. Zero interest in having an opinion. How many of you trade genuinely opinion-free? I'm not surprised. Most people don't. I'd be so surprised if a lot of you chimed up and said you did, frankly. 
you want to talk about your experience, Andre, since you're there already, like me? But those, they won't believe me, but they might believe you. Um, have your results improved? Has your sleep level improved? <laughs> and I'm not saying it did. For some people it doesn't. For most people it does, but for some people it doesn't. The door does swing both ways. <clears throat> That's fine. You can still follow the fundamentals. It's just not necessary. It's not absolutely necessary, but it's not... It doesn't necessarily hurt you either. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so you're finding that it is helping to be systematic and to be close to opinion-free. Those of you that are trading your opinion, which I realize is the vast majority of you, you will wake up one day and realize that it's costing you money. That your opinion has done nothing but take money from you. Hear me now and believe me later. Well, Gary, in order to do, you say in order to do that, you have to eliminate all emotion. Obviously, as a human animal, you can't eliminate all emotion. The only way to eliminate all emotion is to be dead. And it's pretty tough to click the mouse when you're dead. Um, so, you're absolutely right. You can't eliminate all emotions. But what you can eliminate is your finger from executing trades based on that emotion. You're not going to stop feeling it. I don't stop feeling it. I still feel it. But I don't trade it. Does that make sense? My brain is just as confused as everyone else's. It will still throw stupidity at me consistently. Which is an opinion, in my opinion. <laughs> stupidity. Uh, so... You know, you can't not feel it, but you can prevent it from executing trades. I, I, that much I promise. And that's simply a decision. You have to make the decision in your own mind, consciously, to not let emotion drive. Did you ever watch Groundhog Day? Where he says, when he's got the, I love the, the, that part, where he's got the, uh, he's got the groundhog in his, in his, uh, in his lap after he steals it. And he's, you know, and he's driving around, he's letting the groundhog drive, and he's like, don't drive angry. <laughs> I always think of that uh, when I'm trading. Don't trade angry. Don't let your emotions drive. Because you're almost guaranteed to have an accident. Do I apply uh, neuro-associative conditioning, NAC, to your trading? Associating pain with not following your plan versus feeling the pain of losing money. Yeah, absolutely. Losing, to me, is not painful, ever. It's part of the process. Is exhaling painful? I mean, if you've got a lung issue, it may be. Um, but, you know, if you're normal, inhaling and exhaling are equally painless. They're part of the process. If you're going to be a trader, you're not just going to have winning trades. Any more than as a breathing, living human being, you could survive this planet by only inhaling. How long could you live on this planet if all you did was inhale? Never ever having a single ex exhale. How, many, how long would you last? An hour? A day? You wouldn't last five minutes. You'd be dead. you got to exhale. It's part of it. Losing is exhaling. It's part of the process. The only person who didn't ever face any losing trades along the way was Bernie Madoff. If you want the kind of results that he generated, have at it. But otherwise, you're going to have to exhale along the way. So a losing trade is not a negative thing. It's part of the process. It's evidence that you're doing something right, not that you're doing something wrong. Losing is not wrong. What's wrong is not following your system. That's when, even if you win, you're wrong. Does that make sense? 
winning and losing a trade has nothing to do with right and wrong. Zero. Immature, inexperienced traders believe that, but that's because they're immature and inexperienced. But winning and losing has nothing to do with right and wrong. Does everybody understand that? Anybody want to argue that point? Let's go. I'll be your huckleberry. Let's dance. Come on, somebody argue with me. I'm in a feisty mood today. Bring it. Winning and losing has nothing to do with right and wrong. Right and wrong has to do with being correct, following along with your rules or not. You take a trade and you win based on not following your rules, that's wrong. You take a trade and you lose based on following your rules, that's right. So don't be caught up in what I like to call idiot land and believe that winning and losing correlates to right and wrong. That is for the, frankly unintelligent. It's not true. The sooner you get over it, the sooner you get over it. <laughs> um, Prancer says, how do you determine the X point? Because for the one hour USD bear, uh, the X point could be at 158.50. The X point, um, Prancer, is the Out of all the out of the five points that we really look for, is the least important. Um, it's going to have the least impact on everything. Um, your A, B, C, D uh, points are far more important um, than your X point. Because if you think about it, your A, B, C, D is going to be the same regardless of where your X is. Nine out of ten times. There's, okay, there's always room for a slight exception, but the vast vast majority of the time, your your A, B, C, D points are going to be identical regardless of where you end up putting your X. The X is going to be preferably at whatever the most, you know, whatever the historical swing high or swing low was at that time. But it's really not the most important part of the puzzle, if you will. I don't know if that helps or not, but just to be straight. Brendan says, how did you condition yourself to following your plan? Um, it wasn't easy, but it was extremely easy. It was hard to get myself to, to actually do it, but it was really easy to understand that it had to be done. I mean, think about it. Uh, it, it goes back to Statistics 101. If I wanted to flip a coin, um, you know, and I know that the coin is going to come out 50-50 because, because that's the way it is, because there's only two options. Um, you know, heads or tails, and we know it's, a, we assume it's an even quarter, so we're gonna, we know it's gonna come out basically 50-50. If I only did three trades, it might be heads, 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 or tails, 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 or heads, heads, tails, or tails, tails, heads. Either way, the statistics would not be 50-50, right? So if I was mathematically foolish, I would, you know, throw my hands up in frustration and say the quarter's a scam and blah, 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 and, and freak out because in a small sample size, I would not have realized the statistical reality. Well, the statistical reality is you could never realize it on a small sample size, and that is where the average human goes wrong, because they think they're going to get rich off of five trades. You're not. You can get rich off of 5,000, but not off of five. So, I mean, if you do it on five, it's, you have to chalk it up to luck, not skill. Um, so... For me, the the way that I got myself to do it was to realize very logically and simply that if I was ever to realize the statistical reality of anything, I would have to have a large enough sample size to make that plausible, let alone possible. You know, if you do 10 instances of anything and you think you can you can draw a conclusion based on those 10 instances, then to put it nicely, you're a mathematical idiot. I don't mean you personally. I mean anyone. Anyone who thinks they can draw a conclusion from any <coughs> sample size of 10 data points is a freaking idiot, to put it nicely. So <coughs> I didn't want to be an idiot, <laughs> to put it simply. I wasn't going to let being an idiot be the reason I lost. Does that make sense? That's how I got myself 
to follow my plan, to realize that there was no other choice other than to be stupid and lose my money. Which I've done that already. <laughs> I've already got that t-shirt too. It wasn't that I was going to all of a sudden, it was that I was going to stop being stupid. Because <laughs> I had been for a long time, like most people. It's a common disease. Mathematical incompetence is a common disease in this world. But it's a curable one. Very curable one. All it takes is desire. The desire not to be stupid. I don't know if that was the answer you wanted, but that's the process that I went through. Having the epiphany of realizing that there really was no other way. I mean, is there another way? If you think about it, like, logically, I wish there was. If there is, please let me know, because I would rather take a shortcut. <laughs> but but um, I haven't been able to find one. So... Um, Andre, hell no, I've lost my share of money, but at the end of the day, I'm plus plus, good, good. When you journal, what things do you keep in mind? Do you focus on the result of the trade or more the process? I'm much more focused on the process, making sure that the process is systematic. The results are kind of circumstantial. If the process is systematic and the underlying statistics are solid, then the end result is kind of borderline irrelevant, you know what I mean? It's just like the coin flip example. You know, each flip of the coin, if we if we made a decision or tried to make, you know, draw a distinction based on each individual instance of the coin flipping, where would we be? We'd be nowhere. We'd be lost, like most people. Right? But if we look at it as a whole, if we look at it as, okay, this is a 50-50 thing, and I know that if I do it a few hundred times, or preferably a few thousand times, that the 50-50 is going to is going to you know show itself. The statistical reality that is the 50-50. I mean, um, so yeah, I'm more <clears throat> answer to, to answer your question. I'm more interested in making notes about the process, and then using those notes to find ways to to convince myself, if you're not already convinced, that you have to be consistent. How much sample do you have in the, oh, what size, sample size? The more the better. I mean, the bigger the better. At least a few hundred, and preferably a few thousand. But you can't make a, a real statistical decision based on 10 or 20 or 30. I mean, and that's not my opinion. Go ask a statistician. Go ask anybody, you know what I mean, that's good at stats or mathematics, and they'll tell you the same thing. That, you know, a, a sample size of 10 or 20 or 30 is, well, insulting, ridiculous, invalid, at best, or inconclusive, I should say, at best. <clears throat> but that's why this business is so, is such a big opportunity, because... <clears throat> that's what the masses do. That's what the 90% out there does. They do three trades with one method, three trades with another method, three trades with another method. They never actually get anywhere because they never actually start acting consistently. They think consistency is something that they're going to buy off a of ClickBank for $97. It's not. Consistency is an action, and only you can get yourself to act consistently. Just like Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent forest fires. Okay, Coco says, in an effort in effort of excluding emotions from our trade executions, how important trading in the direction of the trend? Which time frame, I guess, depending on swing trading, should we focus on and properly determine a directional time frame for that matter? <clears throat> hmm. 
you're not going to like my answer, which is why I'm hesitating. Um, I could care less about the trend. The trend is not my friend, it's not my enemy, and it's not relevant. I really don't care about the trend, the so-called trend, because the trend is relative to, just like you said, to the time frame. You could have a five-minute uptrend inside of a 15-minute downtrend inside of a 30-minute uptrend inside of a 60-minute downtrend inside of a four-hour uptrend. Everyone knows that, right? None of what I just said is anything less than totally true. You can have, you always have multiple trends happening at the same time, depending on the, the time frame that you're focused on. So, <clears throat> it ha you have to kind of compare apples to apples and keep it relative to whatever time frame you're, you're primarily looking at if you're going to try to determine trend. And it really doesn't matter, like I said because there's multiple trends going on at all times in both directions. Except for in, you know, a market that's moving parabolic. But anything short of parabolic movement and you'll have both both sides happening almost simultaneously, almost within each other. So, um, for me, it's not important. It's not relevant. I'm only concerned with, is there a pattern? Is there some sort of probabil probability in an, you know, a, a, of, of a directional change? And then within that probability, is there favorable risk to reward? That's the only two criteria I look at. Probability and risk to reward. That's it. Everything else is BS as far as I'm concerned. Or unnecessary. It's like a triple nipple. It's fun to play with, but you don't need it. So, I know in trading everyone is so enamored by this word trend, and that's great, and I'm not trying to dissuade you from the trend being your friend or whatever everybody wants to believe. That's to each his own. I'm just telling you, there is another point of view, and at least another point of view, <laughs> many other points of view, and mine is just one of them. I don't find the trend to hell hold any real meaning to me. It doesn't change anything for me. It doesn't influence me. I'm not even aware of what it is, frankly, when, I'm, when I make a decision. I really don't care. It's not based on that. Just because a trend is, has existed for the last X number of bars in the past makes zero statement probabilistically uh, speaking for, uh, from, a probab from a probability standpoint. It doesn't mean the next bar by any stretch of the imagination is more or less likely to be influenced by the trend if you're just looking at the trend by itself. There's other tools that you can use to help figure that out like the Hearst exponent like you see on my charts on the bottom here. But just the trend in and of itself doesn't tell you anything about the probability that that trend is going to continue or not continue, for that matter. It doesn't tell you anything. It just tells you, hey, in the past, there has been a trend. That makes no statement about the future. So, like I said, probably not the answer you wanted. But it's my answer. <laughs> it's the honest answer, at least. How does bias differ from trend? Bias is based on probability, for me. Trend is based on past, on, on, on the past. But like I said, it has no statement to, about probability within it. But a bias does have a statement of probability wrapped inside of it, at least the way I look at it. I mean, to each his own. It's kind of an ambiguous word in a way, but bias, I mean. But right now, I'm biased, for instance, of wanting to um, buy yen, basically. Sell dollar yen, sell pound yen, sell euro yen, sell anything against long yen position. Not anything, but almost anything. Not right now, in this exact second, but I mean, if we see dollar yen in particular, 
continue to go higher, back towards maybe the 84 handles, handle, that's when I would start looking at it as a sell opportunity, which of course means you're buying yen. So much like we talked about last week, um, Andre, where we, last week what we, we, where you said great call on weakness, on the U.S. dollar weakness from last week, this week um, is similar. I would look for more weakness uh, or more strength, I should say, in the dollar to sell into to get positioned for weakness to come. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to get some more coffee in me. So, does that help? Does that answer the questions? Good questions today, guys. You guys are really drilling down in the in, into the kind of minutia of things, which is good. It means this, hopefully, it means that you at least understand the basic stuff, and you're now kind of exploring the little detail parts of it, which is fun and necessary. Uh, Prancer, there is a says there is a possible bull bat forming on the one hour JPY yen below a fifty for two trade. Where would you enter? Where would you place a bull bat? Well, let's go look at that. Right now, I don't really see anything bullish or bearish. It's pretty much just in this in the same range it's been for well end of last week. You can see the sell signals from late la from uh, when we were above 84 the last time, and I, like I said, I would prefer to be getting short somewhere closer to 84 again than where we sit right now. If you look at this thing on the daily chart, you can see the bearish pattern that's been in play for some time here, the bearish bat pattern. You can see the D point goes all the way up almost to 85, which is why I was saying I'd really want to be shorting this thing above 84. Because at that point, you have a really good risk-reward ratio. You're risking about 100 to make the B point down here at 79. So you're looking at risking 100 to make 4 to 500. So 4, 5 to 1, that's pretty good. I mean, it's a daily pattern, so it's going to take months to play out. But certainly not something that I would expect to play out over the course of a couple of days or even a couple of weeks. But Play out at will. If you took the trade, where would you enter? I, well, I, again, from a bullish standpoint, I really don't see a bullish thing at 82. Well, at 8250, I'd have to go look at that. 8250. That's 100 points from here. I guess you'd say this would be your X. This would be your A, this would be your B, this could be your C then, and you'd have, a, I see what you're saying. That's a possibility, Prancer, but I wouldn't, I would have to visit that when it, if and when it got down to that point. I, I can tell you as a normal bat pattern, my stops would be probably at least below the X point. most likely somewhere below that, but I'd have to see it in the moment to, to be totally straight. Jack says, yen weakness may last for six months to one year if you buy yen now. Well, I'm not looking that far ahead, first of all, six months to one year. I, I would definitely not hold on to a trade that long. But when you're looking at this daily chart, you can see that the cyclical pressure and probability is that it will start to move lower over the longer haul, like you're saying, over the, over the course of the next few months. So can you, to realize that move all the way back to the B point, yeah, I think you're probably right, Jack. It probably would take an upwards of six months to complete, maybe even more. But um, The general rule of thumb that I, I've learned from experience is that it will take at least, you know, one third of the time it took for the pattern to play out, or to, to build to play out. So if it took three months, then it'll take a month. If it took three years, it could take a year. 
you know, um, and that's not a hard, it's not a guarantee that it will play out in three months. It's just a minimum. That certainly could take longer, and occasionally go shorter too. But for the most part, the rule of thumb is about three times. Or one third, excuse me. So, again, for me, Jack, I'm not going to sit in a trade for six months. I'm going to trade it back and forth along the way many times. But if you're, you know, comfortable with that long term of a holding period, then sure, there's probably nothing wrong with it. You still need to be running stops above 85, which means you're talking about 150 points of risk from current which is a little rich for my blood, personally. But, again, for position trading, it, it, it's, that's not too bad, and, and probably what you would uh, need to do anyway. Canster, emerging butterfly and emerging macro garlic on daily U.S. CAD. Yeah, I'll look at that in a second. The risk-to-reward varies according to which time frame you use, right? The different people different time frames have you sell additional artifacts and how the late targets are used. Actually, no. Um, risk to reward does not change um, according to time frame. At least it doesn't for me. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't mathematically change, but the criteria that, I, or the criteria that I'm looking for to, to decide if I actually can take a trade doesn't change from time frame to time frame. The bare minimum of one and a half to one, preferably two or three to one. And that's whether it's in a five minute, a fifteen minute, or a five year chart, I could care less. I gotta have at least one and a half to one positive risk to reward ratio, or I'm not even vaguely interested. And even one and a half to one is only vaguely interested. Prancer, how do you determine the stops for BF, best friend? Oh no, butterfly, gotcha. <laughs> Best friend. Um, and <laughs> are there certain fib ratios you use? Um, the easiest, simplest, most consistent answer is outside of the PRZ by 13 to 34 pips. Occasionally there are exceptions to the rule, but very rarely. And I, I would just ignore the exceptions until you figure out how to make your own if you even want to. But basically, um, yeah. 13 to 34 pips outside of the PRZ depending on ATR. Greater the ATR, the greater the, the breathing room, the greater the stop. All right, what else? What else you guys want to look at? Anything? Anything exciting? Give me a second here. I'm going to show some other stuff just for fun. Okay, so um, here's a look at some of the harmonic patterns that have come through the, the market in the last 24 hours. And you'll notice most of them have been short term. Late last night, we actually had a bunch of longer term stuff popping out. And I mentioned more macro patterns against the yen. And you can see them all here, as well as the British pound right here. So it's definitely something that I'm keeping an eye on for today. Prancer, how you determine a PRZ is, is just part of the normal uh, harmonic pattern. In particular, for a butterfly, it's going to usually be something between the BC leg uh, sorry, the CD leg is going to be something between a 1618 and a 2618 extension of the BC leg. Normally, the software will just highlight it for you, but if you do it the old-fashioned way like I do, um, you would just throw a fib, you know, you can just throw a fib ratio on there, um, extension ratio, and see where the one two se uh, 1618 to 2618 range is. Here, I'll show you. We've done it before, but I'll show you real quick. Um... So here's this pattern, right? We know it's there. The software's already identified it. I'm going to pull a blank chart and just do it without all the
all bells and whistles. So, control G, and move that over. So this is your X point, this is your A point, this is your B point, this is your C point, and this is your D point. So if we measure, put a fib extension ratio from B to C, that tells us that the PRZ is going to fall between here, 1618, and here, 2618. So anywhere in here. So I'd be running my stops out above this point, outside of the upper boundary, by, like I said, 13 to 34 pips above it. in this case because it's a short below if it's a long of course Sam says CAD Yen has had a very directional run over the last two weeks and wondering if the pattern is forming now yes there is one there I was looking at it this morning I'll go over there in a second Boyke says do you not take stops larger than 34. No, I'm saying 13 to 34 pips margin outside of the PRZ. I'll take stops wider than 34, for sure. That's just the amount of variance, if you want, or breathing room that I like to give it outside of the predetermined PRZ. Boyke, you know I like Fibonacci. I have the Fibonacci uh, golden spiral tattooed on my right forearm. So, <laughs> I I don't just like Fibonacci. I love it. If it was single, I'd marry it, and I don't believe in marriage. <laughs> All right, Canadian yen, Sam. Let's go look at that. That has some um, interesting setups that we were, I was looking at earlier. Let me get rid of it this way. Look at it this way. And I think it shows daily. Yeah. So on a daily, you have a crab pattern, kind of a textbook X. A, B, B, C, D. You see the perfect 3618 extension? That's what tells you it's a crab. So yeah, filling up here, running stops above the old highs and looking for a move back towards the B point, I call it 78. This is definitely what I'm looking at. The Hearst exponent is... Um, down here at 0.38, very anti-persistent. So it's telling us that the, the, the past is now negatively influencing the, pr the present and therefore the future. So what has been happening in the past is not likely to keep happening in the present and therefore the future. So what's been happening, like you said, has been that upward cycle. So Statistically speaking, it's telling us that that cycle is likely to have run its course for the most part. So selling into additional strength, especially a spike above, you know, 84.50 or something like that, would be what I'm looking to do. Do I have a pick of my forearm? Yeah, I probably do somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I know I do. I just don't know if I have it on this computer. Um... What else, guys? What else should we look at? I got about 10 minutes left before they're going to make me ramp up.
All right. Do you have a pic of your forearm? Oh, yeah, here. See? Fibonacci spiral. That was right when I got it done. You see how it's still a little red? That was. This is uh, the Trump, uh, the Trump bar and the Trump tower in Manhattan. And there's my Fibonacci necklace too. And my ugly mug. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, so it sounds, Sam, like we're on the same page there with that Canadian. Yeah, definitely looks like there's going to be some opportunity there in the not-too-distant future, if not already. I'm going to, like I said, already be a little patient with it and try to sell a last bout of strength if it comes. But we'll see. We'll cross that bridge as we get to it. U.S. cat, butterfly on the daily. Canadian I'm not really interested in. Um, it does have this bullish pattern that you're, I think you're talking about. The risk-reward ratio, though, is uh, inverted, actually. It's actually negative. So I've, even though it's a pattern and the probability is still 70% that it'll play itself out, blah, 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 the risk-reward is not good enough for me to care. So I'm not interested <laughs> Why I don't believe in marriage? Because marriage requires swearing in front of one of two institutions that I completely don't believe in, politics and religion. You have to get married in front of either a judge or a minister. I think they're both equally... Hmm, how do I say it? Misguided. <laughs> to put it nicely. Not that it matters. The two largest failed institutions on the planet, politics and religion. Man's two worst inventions. Not really. I was raised uh, in the traditional Ronald Reagan ridiculous Republican mindset, <laughs> which is a nice way of saying stupid. Euro US, sure. I talked about the Euro earlier. Um, it's it's dead. I mean, there's uh, there's no real probability in any major directional bias one way or the other at this time, unless you're looking at the absolute super duper short term stuff. Um, but for the longer term stuff, there's there's really nothing to go on here uh, that I would base a trade off of. You can see, um, while in the very short term there's some bearish signals, the projection moving forward is still higher. So I would I would not want to sell into that yet, if at all. Um, and that being said, I would also not buy it. I would not chase it because you still have shorter term cyclical pressure to the downside here. And you don't have any sort of a harmonic pattern to give you any sort of, a, of an edge either. So, I'm not interested in the euro at this time. I realize it just had this little spike or whatever, but I don't care. So what? Market's always spiking somewhere. Short term, you see it did give you a bullish harmonic pattern before it took off here to the upside, although it was a tiny pattern and not one that I personally would have taken. But it did give you a signal, at least, that the probability was likely that what you've now seen was what was coming. Oh, you did? 
Well, if you took it, did you take, Andre, did you take it based on this, on the pattern? If you took it based on the pattern, um, even if you didn't now, hindsight being 2020, but if you did, you absolutely would want to be, have your stops at, at, at a profit now, at least at break even, preferably locking in some kind of profit. And I got to be honest with you, I would be out of it. At least, at least half of it. Not because I don't think it's going to go further, but because if you based it on the original pattern, the amount of movement that you've gotten already far exceeds what you, you know, normally would have even expected. So good for good, good for you that you caught it. That's great. And you moved your stops. Good. Awesome. Once your stops are moved to break even, that's when you can become as greedy as you want to be. You know, that's when you can start doing, you know, for lack of a nicer way to say it, stupid things. And I don't mean you personally, I mean anyone. Because at that point, you've removed your risk. So if you want to hang on like grim death for the next month and see if it goes to 150, go for it. You know what I mean? Who cares? Your stops are protecting you from, you know, uh, for the most part at least, from, uh, from loss. So if you want to be ultra aggressive, that's the other thing that I think a lot of new traders misunderstand. They think that aggressive trading means that you're doing a lot. When I'm my most aggressive, I'm doing nothing. I'm in trades and I'm doing nothing, letting them mature. That's what aggression is in trading, not banging in and out of trades 25 times in a minute. That's not aggressive. That's just stupid. Aggressive is doing nothing. I'm my most aggressive when I'm sitting on my hand. That's what aggressive is because I'm doing nothing. I'm letting my positions play out, mature, do whatever they're going to do. Obviously with stops in place. But I think a lot of people get confused when they think, oh, I want to be an aggressive trader. Okay, well, being an aggressive trader means you do nothing. <laughs> Once you're in your trade, you let them run their full course as best as you possibly can. Yay. All right, I only got a couple minutes left here, and then they're going to send me packing. Anything else you guys want to go over? Anybody got any good jokes today? You're waiting for the hourly. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're waiting for the next hourly close. Cool. That's probably a wise move. Patience pays if you let it, as I'm sure you know. All right, guys. Well, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to wrap it up. Be safe. Have a good week this week. Um, like I already said, personally speaking, at least, I'm going to be looking to buy additional yen weakness. So sell stuff against the yen, in other words. Um, if the yen is the denominator, at least, then I'm going to sell the numerator against it. Um, therefore, buying the denominator. Uh, and... Um, and look to ride those positions through the balance of the week. Um, I also like selling additional strength in the pound, in particular above 159, uh, should it claw its way back up there, which is only about 20 some odd points away. Uh, <laughs> that's at least what I'm looking at to start the week off with. Um, and we'll kind of take it from there. But most importantly, be safe. Follow your plan. If you don't have an, if you don't know what your edge is, you don't have one. If you don't have an edge, you have no business trading with real money, unless losing is a hobby. Um, better to be out of the market wishing you were in than in the market wishing you were out. And there are old traders and there are bold traders, but there are no old, bold traders. So, I would be very, very careful with all of that. All right. Thank you, FX Street, as always. I will see you all back here next week.